Did you know there's actually several Japan exclusive Pokemon games on one of Nintendo's most beloved handhelds, the Game Boy Advance? Nintendo created several mini games based on the Pokemon series for the GBA, but these weren't part of a standard retail release. They were distributed through the Pokemon trading card game. Special edition cards were released for the TCG that could be scanned into the Nintendo eCard reader. This was a device for the Game Boy Advance that could read encoded strips of data, similar to a magnetic strip reader on a credit card machine, which could scan a line of code from cards and then send that data to the GBA. Some of these cards would hold additional content for full retail titles, but in the case of Pokemon, some cards were released that held their own exclusive, fully-fledged mini-games. We say fully-fledged, but they weren't exactly going to stun the audiences with their incredible gameplay, though we wouldn't call them a waste of time either. A fair amount of these cards were released internationally, but Japan had a collection of promotional cards which never had any publication outside of the region. These include Exciting Hide and Seek, this one's less of a game and more of a simple animated cartoon, likely based on the animated short Pikachu's Peekaboo, known in Japan as Pikachu's Exciting Hide and Seek. There are two different possible versions of this animated skit involving Pikachu and Lavatar hiding from one another. Next is Imakuni's Ball. Based on the Ball Game & Watch title, it involves juggling balls by using the left and right buttons, Though, in this instance, the player's character is replaced by Tomoaki Imakuni, a Japanese musician who performed several songs for the Pokemon anime and promotional material for the TCG. He was even featured on several Pokemon cards, including the card required to play this game. There's also Wooper's Juggling Game. Taking on the role of Wooper, the objective here is to use the Wooper's water gun attack to keep Poliwag and Totodile off the ground. After a short while, Psyduck then gets dropped into the mix, with Poliwag falling faster than Totodile, and Psyduck taking two blasts before being projected higher. Then there's Big Fruit Strategy. Here, the player controls Totodile as the Mon swims in the water, with the goal of collecting as much fruit as possible while avoiding a number of Tentacruel. The player then obtains different point values depending on which fruit is collected, and the game finishes once the player crosses the finish line of the course. And last but not least, there's Toko Toko Truck. This game has two Pichus riding a hand car while passing different train stations. Their final destination is the Pokemon Center in Tokyo, but they have to get there before the time runs out by jumping over boulders left on the track along the way. There are plenty more Pokemon games exclusive to Japan which we'll be covering in this video. As usual, we'll be extensive, but we won't be counting demos or games that later got a comprehensive release in other regions, such as Pokemon Star Stadium or Great Detective Pikachu Birth of a New Duo, or even Pokemon green, as the original green and red were basically just less polished versions of what we got in the West. We also won't be counting apps that have no game-like elements, like Pokemon PC Master, which essentially just taught kids how to use a PC. We'll also have one pretty unique game we want to talk about at the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. Now, we try not to be biased on this channel, but the next game we're talking about is definitely our favourite game in this video. The Pokemon trading card game on the Game Boy was a huge change to the original games. Developed by Hudson, these games translated the mechanics of the Pokemon trading card game into a video game format. The game received an international release to wide acclaim, so it was surprising to learn that the game's sequel remains exclusive to Japan even to this day. Also by Hudson, Pokemon Card GB2 Here Comes Team GR boasted several new features and improvements over its predecessor. An optional choice of the player's gender was added, a training mode was included to teach people how to actually play the game well, and a deck diagnosis system was introduced to rate the player's crafted deck. Compared to the first game, which had 228 cards, GB2 was bumped up to a total of 445 cards. Probably the most iconic card added to GB2 was Great Rocket's Mewtwo, which was featured prominently in the game, and a real-life version of the card was distributed in Japan, bundled with special edition Celebi-themed Game Boy Advances, which means GR Mewtwo was Japan-exclusive both physically and digitally. Here's a translation of the card text. As you can see, its abilities essentially make it the captain of all dark Pokemon. It wasn't just the card count that was increased, but the size of the entire game was increased massively. Rather than a simple collect all the badges plot, a rival team was introduced known as Team Great Rocket, led by King Bidadichi. 
This group kidnaps the clubmasters from around the island featured in the original release and steals everyone's cards. So the player assumes the role of a hero that sets off to rescue the masters and restore the status quo. Similarly to how Pokemon Gold and Silver introduced the second island, TCG GB2 is also made up of two different islands. The island featured in the first game and a second island called GR Island. This was partly to address a common complaint with the first game, its rather short playtime. The game's graphics were also noticeably improved, with areas having much more deep theming, characters having more animations, and a new selection of coins for the player to use during the match's initial coin toss. Another introduction to the card game sequel was a game center, where the player is able to play a variety of minigames similar to that of the main series. This may be our bias speaking as fans of the Pokemon TCG game on the Game Boy, but this title is actually very enjoyable as a sequel, holding up even today. But this begs the question as to why it never saw an English release, and sadly, this isn't a hard question to answer. Pokemon Card GB2 released at the late date of March 28, 2001. This was just a week after the release of the Game Boy Advance, and with the original Pokemon TCG Game Boy release taking years to be localized outside of Japan, if this title was localized into English, it probably would have been released in 2002 or perhaps even 2003, meaning this sequel would have been in direct competition with Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire. And with GB2 essentially being twice the size of the original original game, it would have been more prudent for Nintendo to put those localization resources towards a GBA game instead. Lucky for the Pokemon franchise, the collectible creatures managed to become such a strong brand that they didn't have to be constrained to one genre, or even popular genres. The world of sports saw its own Pokemon game with extremely limited availability. Poker Park Fishing Rally DS was available for just a few months in 2005, and could only be obtained through the DS Download Play kiosk. These kiosks could originally be found in Poker Park, a theme park dedicated to the franchise. Though they would later be placed in Japanese Pokemon Center stores and at Pokemon Festa, an annual Pokemon convention. The title's gameplay takes place on a river flowing into the sea, with the area changing over time. The top screen would display the shadows of different Pokemon underwater, and the player must cast their line onto the screen, pressing the A button when the floater is pulled under, and then repeatedly tapping to pull the catch. Each Pokemon caught is displayed on the touch screen, with their different scores being shown on the top screen based on the size of the Pokemon, level and rarity. Scores would be tallied at the end of play, with the top 50 scores being sent back to the kiosk and placed upon a score list shown on screen. Not only is the game limited in its release, only being available via a region-specific kiosk, but there was also no means of actually storing the game, meaning that should the player's DS be shut down, it could no longer be played. While one could, in theory, keep their DS powered up and the game left running at all times, it would still be unavailable long term, as the game was also restricted to a 12-hour time limit. Partly due to its limited distribution and semi-permanent state, the title has now become lost media, with the only known ROM being held by a private collector who refuses to make the ROM public despite constant requests from the community. Although he did, at the very least, record himself playing the game to give us a better look at how it functioned. Moving away from the card games and fishing spin-offs to special hardware. The Pokemon Mini was a dedicated handheld made just to house a collection of games relating to Pokemon. While the system was released worldwide, not all games received localization, with some titles being restricted to just Japan. A total of 10 cartridges were published for the system, with only 4 getting released in the US, while there are 5 exclusive to Japan, and an additional game which released both in Japan and Europe, Pokemon Tetris. As is likely an obvious statement, this would be a crossover with the classic Tetris gameplay with Pokemon elements strewn in. While every other game for the Mini was developed by Japanese studios Jupiter and Denyusha, Pokemon Tetris is the one game in the Mini's library to be actually developed by Nintendo themselves. As an aside, it's also the last game where Jinx is depicted with the original skin coloring. This version of Tetris is regarded as one of the best games released for the Mini and has a high asking price on the pre-owned market. The European release is especially elusive, with only a few thousand copies ever being printed. Plans were clearly made to release the title in the US as well, with it having received an ESRB classification under the title Pokemon Mini Shock Tetris. 
The other Japan exclusive titles include a platform racer hybrid called Pokemon Race Mini and an adventure game called Togepi's Great Adventure, a sequel to Pokemon Puzzle Mini which featured 80 new puzzles and a follow-up to Party Mini featuring the Pichu Bros, characters that made their debut in the anime short Pikachu and Pichu, shown alongside the third Pokemon movie. The last game released for the Mini was Pokemon Breeder Mini in December 2002, a virtual pet style game similar to that of a Tamagotchi. The Mini was released during the second generation of Pokemon, with Gold and Silver having been released a year prior in North America. With Breeder Mini in particular, the system briefly overlapped into the third generation as it featured the starter Pokemon from Ruby and Sapphire, with those two titles releasing in Japan a month prior. There's evidence showing a couple of these mini titles were even considered for wider release, but it's likely these plans were hampered due to the system's low sales. The Pokemon Mini has largely been forgotten and is generally considered one of Nintendo's hardware failures. But some of Japan's Pokemon exclusives were on popular hardware, very popular hardware. The region received three versions of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon created exclusively for the Nintendo Wii, made available as WiiWare downloads on the Nintendo Shop channel in late 2009 for 1200 Wii points, or about $12 each. These titles were Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Keep Going Blazing Adventure Squad, Let's Go Stormy Adventure Squad, and Go For It Light Adventure Squad. Developed by Chunsoft, these entries mark the only time that Mystery Dungeon has appeared on a home console. They're also the only entries in the subseries not to receive an international release. Often referred to as the Adventure Squad series, and contrary to other Mystery Dungeon games, these three titles put little emphasis on storyline. The game's plot starts with a group of Pokemon being sent by Slowking to rescue a lost Shuckle. After returning to town, he explains that he was searching for some delicious food, a story that will continue to unfold as progress is made. This then opens up the game's bulletin board, where Pokemon post requests for the player to undertake in exchange for a reward. Depending on which of the three iterations of the game is being played, the hub world will differ. For Blazing Squad, the location is a Pokemon village near a volcano. In Stormy Squad, the player is based at Pokemon Beach, and for Light Squad, the hub is a Pokemon Garden, which is held within a forest. The games made use of the same 3D graphics featured in My Pokemon Ranch, another WiiWare release which simplified the graphical style of each Pokemon. And according to IGN, the game's developers were aiming for something which resembles a picture book. Additional missions can be added to the game through the Wii's Wii Connect 24 feature, which will download while the Wii is in sleep mode. For a short period after the game released, several promotional codes were distributed as well, which could be entered through the game's Wonder Mail menu. These codes could be used to unlock unique Pokemon who the player could then use throughout the dungeons. These titles never saw a release outside of Japan, but this doesn't mean that they were never intended to be translated. Copyright filings were made in the US for each game's title, not just with their direct translations, but also a second set of filings for reimagined subtitles, which put the elements at the end of their names. The names were Forward Adventurers of Flame, Let's Go Adventurers of Storm, and Aspire Adventurers of Light. During development, IGN reported on the games multiple times assuming that they'd receive international localization, but this never came to fruition. To many, the lack of a stateside release was surprising, seeing as the Pokemon franchise has always had a strong following in the West. The Wii had a massive install base in 2009 and 2010, so why the game never surfaced in the West remains a bit of a mystery. In a positive turn of events though, a team of people at Project Pokemon released translation patches for all three games, making them playable in English over a decade after their original release. These translation patches not only aim to localize the game in a similar manner to that of previous official English releases, but also brought back almost all of the online features, including downloadable event missions and legendaries. Moving on from Pokemon games on popular hardware to Pokemon games on a console which some people have never heard of. The Sega Pico saw an exceptionally limited release worldwide, but was particularly popular with Japanese schoolchildren. Despite their association with Nintendo, the owners of the Pokemon brand, the Pokemon Company, aren't exclusively controlled by Nintendo. They have the option to create products branching across multiple video game platforms, which allows the series to reach a wider audience than just those interested in Nintendo hardware. 
Before we explain the Pico's Pokemon games, we should first give a brief introduction of what on earth the Sega Pico even is and where it came from. The Pico was released in Japan in 1993 and saw an international release a year later in 1994. The system held some mild success for a number of years, though it was ultimately discontinued outside of Japan in 1998. In Japan, however, the system would see continued support until as late as 2005. As of April 2005, 3.4 million Pico consoles had been sold at retail, with over 11 million software sales across 300 different pieces of software. The Pico hardware was derived from that of the Sega Mega Drive or Genesis, though differed dramatically in control and function. The Pico is shaped somewhat like a laptop, but without a screen or full keyboard, instead having a pad controlled by a quote, magic pen, as well as some colored directional buttons. Cartridges for the console aren't actually cartridges in the traditional sense either, referred to as storyware. Each game comes in the form of a picture book with a slot on the bottom which connects to the top half of the system, with the game progressing as each page of the book is turned. While the system saw a limited international release, none of the Pokemon titles made for the system were ever localized in the West. One of these region locked titles was Pokemon Catch the Numbers, which released July 23, 2002, and featured the second generation of Pokemon. It was designed to teach children numeracy skills, with the story following Pikachu and Togepi after Team Rocket steals all of Ash, Misty, and Brock's other Pokemon. The player is faced with a selection of minigames that must be completed in order to retrieve the lost companions. As a side note, within the data of Catch the Numbers, a sprite of a wheezing can be found, which would ultimately never be used in-game. Another title is Pokemon Advance Generation I've Begun Hiragana and Katakana, which released November 17th, 2003 and used the third generation of Pokemon. It was designed to teach Japanese children how to read and write Hiragana and Katakana script. The story again involves Team Rocket, with them deceiving Ash, Brock, May, and Max by disguising themselves and telling them that they need 25 Pokemon to progress to the Pokemon stage. Each Pokemon is caught by correctly drawing 5 Kana. If Pokemon on the Sega console wasn't enough, the Pikachu Pico was a Pikachu branded Pico released in 2004, a year before the end of the Pico's life cycle. This system had no technical differences to a standard Pico console, and of course was made solely as a way of boosting the system's sales. The console came bundled with a copy of Pokemon Advanced Generation, I've Begun Hiragana and Katakana. And the last game published on the standard Pico was Pokemon Advanced Generation, Pico for Everyone, Pokemon Loud Battle, released on July 13th, 2004. The game again includes the third generation of Pokemon. The game stars Ash, Brock, May, and Team Rocket, and the game is mainly based around reading and playing minigames. The title came with a Pikachu themed controller featuring various minigames that were playable in a competitive two player mode, with both players using either side of the controller. Inevitably, the Sega Pico would come to the end of its life cycle in 2005, but the Pico brand wouldn't be entirely scrapped. Instead, a new and improved follow up to the console was created for the Japanese market. This successor, the Advanced Pico Bina, was released in 2005 and is often referred to as simply the Bina. The two systems were very similar in design, though the Beena features an additional set of buttons on its right side to accommodate left-handed children, as well as built-in speakers and new ports for add-ons, such as an SD card reader, which can be used to save game progress and store images. And of course, the Beena got more Pokemon titles. Pokemon Advanced Generation Pokemon Number Battle released on October 1st in 2005, the game uses the third generation of Pokemon. The game mostly involves finding hidden Pokemon in various scenes, as well as solving math questions and puzzles. After this, Intellectual Training Drill Pokemon Diamond and Pearl Letter and Number Intelligence game was released on the 21st of April 2007 and featured the fourth generation of Pokemon. The game was geared towards teaching children general knowledge, words and numbers, asking them to do tasks such as counting Pokemon and grouping them together based on on-screen prompts. Pokemon Diamond and Pearl Search for Pokemon Adventure in the Maze was released on September 17th, 2009, again using the fourth generation Pokemon. This title seems to focus more on the Pokemon brand itself, with the player having to use the book to highlight Pokemon either based on their silhouettes or finding them in on-screen mazes. The game also encourages children to learn the Pokemon by name alone rather than relying entirely on images. 
And lastly, Pokemon Best Wishes Intelligence Training Pokemon Big Sports Meet was released on December 4th, 2010 and included Generation 5 Pokemon. The player takes on the role of Ash through various games which involve learning Hiragana, numbers and English, as well as completing a number of exercises in order to win medals. Through the use of the Beena SD card reader, sold separately, it is possible to save and print images created in-game. Our next game that never left the land of the rising sun was also educational, well sort of. After the success of the first generation titles, Pokemon had solidified itself as a huge player in gaming. Nintendo naturally wanted to capitalize on the series' fame and ejected Pokemon into its new series of Picross titles, the Picross NP series. The series was exclusively available via download using the Nintendo Power Service in 1999 in Japan. The service allowed players to store a game on a blank Super Famicom cartridge using the in-store kiosk and take it home with them. Picross NP Volume 1, the first in the series, kicked things off by putting Pokemon front and center. In total, the game features 12 different Pokemon-based puzzles, one each for Meowth, Mr. Mime, Psyduck, the Clefairy Doll, Togepi, Electrode, Gloom, Pikachu, Zapdos, Rapidash, Poliwag, and Snorlax. Since the Picross NP series was made exclusively for the Nintendo Power Service and the service never left Japan, it's safe to bet that this is why the series never came to the West. You could argue that Nintendo could have just slapped all eight Picross MP titles on a cartridge in English for a quick buck, but 1995's Mario Picross was a flop in both US and Europe. This would make an English localization of Picross NP a risky move, one that probably wasn't worth it. Remember that awesome trading card game we talked about earlier? Well, there were a couple more trading card games that stayed with Japanese audiences exclusively, though they lacked a fully-fledged adventure mode like Pokemon Card GB2. One of these TCG titles was a Japanese exclusive browser game called Pokemon Card Game Online, which released in 2009. Be sure not to mistake this game for a similarly titled Pokemon Trading Card Game Online, which is entirely different. Built in Flash, this massively multiplayer online card game is simply a means of playing the physical card game with others across the internet. Utilizing unique access codes included with Leafeon vs Metagross Expert Deck CD-ROMs. For users with a Pokemon Daisuke Club account, signing up for the service also deposited 2,000 action points, the in-game currency, into their account for use via the club's action point system. This game would allow players to use fixed decks against players made up of cards included in their pack purchase. The service only ran for about a year before being discontinued. A few years later, the West would get the aforementioned Pokemon trading card game online, making a localization of this original title redundant. Yet another card game entry was Pokemon Card Game How to Play DS in 2011, which served unsurprisingly as a means of teaching the player the rules of the card game, but on Nintendo DS. The game includes a digital rulebook covering how to play, along with a variety of tutorials. Once completed, five CPU controlled opponents will become available to practice with. The game boasted a pretty neat feature, however, making use of the DS download play function, allowing two players to compete against one another with only one card. Cartridge. The title even came packaged with 90 real Pokemon cards so that you could take that sweet TCG knowledge you just learned out into the real world with you. Though Pokemon is at home on handhelds, many in the West didn't realize that the Pokemon franchise actually had moved to the mobile market earlier than the launch of smartphone. Not only that, but the first mobile application for the series wasn't even created by Nintendo, but rather Square Enix. Released in 2006, Pokemate was a phone application that let players send and receive messages with friends or participate in live chat, but also catch and store Pokemon. When starting the game, the player is given a random Pokemon along with 10 Pokeballs to capture more. Rather than utilizing mechanics of fighting or leveling, instead, the game serves as a virtual pet simulator, with the player caring for their caught Pokemon, just like a Tamagotchi. Players were encouraged to sign up for the game subscription service, which would grant them additional Pokeballs, extra media features, and the ability to catch more than just three Pokemon. While only released in Japan, the game was demonstrated in the US during E3 2006, with many assuming the worldwide launch would be coming at some point. As the result of low interaction from users, 
the service was discontinued in 2008, around the time it would have been unlikely to see an international release. The game can no longer be accessed and all that remains are a limited number of videos and screenshots, making this another piece of Pokemon Lost Media. Pokemon's return to the mobile market came with the launch of smartphones. In 2011, Pokemon Say Tap became the second Pokemon mobile game after Pokemate, and is even more limited in scope. Developed by Creatures Inc., the application is a rhythm game based on the trading card game, with the goal revolving around tapping cards displayed on screen in time to the music and icons as they pass a circle. More points are awarded according to accuracy for the player's timing. This simple feat becomes less impressive after finding out there is only a single song available to play, and it's the ending theme to the Japanese anime at the time of its release. Can you name all the Pokemon BW? <laughs> In a similar vein, just a few years later in 2015, Dancing Pokemon Band took the concept a step further. The player takes control of a Pokemon summoned by Hooper and must tap three different icons, donning different Pokemon faces as musical notes pass over them, with more points being awarded for better timing. Each correctly timed tap fills a meter at the top of the screen, which, when maxed out, causes two additional Pokemon to jump on screen for a 10 second dancing round, where buttons can be tapped freely before the song finishes. After the game ends, the player is given a rank and a Petcha Berry worth different amounts depending on score. These can then be spent to unlock additional Pokemon to play across the game's selection of four songs and three stages. There are also three additional Pokemon that could be unlocked by entering special passwords revealed across Pokemon shows on TV. Pokemon Say Tap and Pokemon Dancing Pokemon Band were only made available for a few months in 2011 and 2015 respectively, and as such were never brought to the West. One could assume that around the mid-2010s, limited releases of internationally renowned series would become an outdated practice, but that simply wasn't the case for Pokemon. The series continued to see more games that never got localization, despite the clear appetite for their availability among fans. A free downloadable Pokemon game limited to Japan was released for the 3DS in 2014, developed by Marvelous, called The Thieves and the Thousand Pokemon. The game's plot revolves around recovering stolen diamonds, supplementing the plot of the 17th Pokemon movie, Diancy and the Cocoon of Destruction. Essentially, a group of thieves has been using their Pokemon to steal valuable diamonds from the Diamond Domain, where they are used as a form of energy. The player takes control of a squad of Chespin, Fennekin and Froki, with one designated as their leader, to recover the stolen artifacts and return them to their rightful place. Players are initially given 50 of whichever starter Pokemon they choose, which can then be taken into a stage as a spendable resource, with additional Pokemon being obtained through Street Pass, or by spending the Nintendo 3DS's Play Coins. The Pokemon obtained via Street Pass will be whichever starter Pokemon the passing player chose as their leader, while the Play Coins are redeemed to obtain more of the player's initial choice. Before selecting a stage, the player must designate how many Pokemon they intend to take with them, with any remaining Pokemon after a stage's completion being lost. Stages are made up of different challenge types, with three different types in total, battle, sneaking, and obstacle clearing. Battle stages involve the player defeating Pokemon in order to advance to a stage, with a battle gauge on top of the screen indicating how the fight is going. If the bar reaches the left, the player loses, while if the bar reaches the right, they win. This is manipulated by sending additional Pokemon into the fight, while the enemy may also send in additional reinforcements, with type effectiveness having influence over a squad's power. After each fight, the player may lose a number of their Pokemon. Sneaking challenges have the player attempt to use stealth to bypass a fight. By holding down the X, Y, or A button, Chespin, Fennekin, and Froakie will attempt to sneak past the opponent, only successfully getting past if they cross a threshold. If the button is released before they make it, they will retreat back to their starting position. The guarding Pokemon may stir and check behind them. If they see any of the player's squad making an approach, the stage will change into a battle scenario. If they don't spot anything, they will move closer to the player's starting position until eventually they spot the player's team and commence in a battle. Obstacle clearing stages face the player against objects which must be cleared by sending Pokemon in. 
A gauge on top of the screen will indicate progress, though unlike a battle, there is never any pushback. No Pokemon are lost during these challenges either, so it's more a sort of gate that can only be passed by having enough Pokemon to meet the threshold. If at any point during a stage the player chooses to stop their progress, the group of Pokemon that had been sent in will remain at the point at which the player quit, being able to rejoin the squad once they reach that point of the stage again. As a result of the Pokemon being expelled after a stage, a player's Pokemon count will become limited before long, leading to them needing to seek out other players to obtain more via Street Pass, or bolstering their initial leader Pokemon via Play Coins. This results in the game being almost impossible to complete in a single sitting, forcing it to be played over multiple days at least in order to progress. Initially, only stages 1 through 16 are available to the player, covering the story of Marilyn and Riot, who appeared in the 17th movie. Additional stages surrounding Argus and Millis are unlocked after stage 6, while four additional stages could be downloaded by players that attended a screening of Dancy in the Cocoon of Destruction in theatres or other special events. By completing these locked stages, a code is awarded to the player to unlock an additional Master Ball that can be used in Pokemon X and Y. The Thieves and the Thousand Pokemon is the most recent regional exclusive Pokemon title in this video, but there's one game we didn't mention yet and it comes with a request for help and a $550 bounty. A demo for a PC edition of Pokemon Mystery Dungeon subtitled Gold Rescue Team was released in the midst of 2007. It was available exclusively in Korean, with the demo being distributed as a free download to anyone who made an account on the Korean Mystery Dungeon website. The demo's size invokes an interesting possibility, being 450 megabytes, the demo took up far more space than what is needed for the limited segment that is playable, leading many in the community to believe that this data may actually contain the full game. Information on this game is immensely scarce, with the only real discussions around it being held on Korean message boards, with essentially no preservation of the original files. To this end, the community is looking to get hold of this demo, with the hopes to reverse engineer it and make it playable. It's a big ask, but consider this a signal boost. We've left a link to more information about the game and the $550 bounty in the description. Did you also know that there's over 30 Mario video games that America never got, or that there's a cancelled Zelda game for the DS that no one had ever heard of until a few weeks ago? For more on those, click or tap one of the videos on screen, and thanks for watching.